My name's Peter Thompson, I'm at Budge today as former chair PLSA, although it has to be said that in my day it was called something different. Uh, but anyway, I'm pleased to welcome uh, as our speakers in this session Chris Martin, the Managing Director of Independent Trustee Services, which is a professional trustee company, and Faith Dixon, who is a partner in SACAS. They're going to be talking primarily uh, about the Halcro case um, and what went on there. And Halcro, Chris uh, chairs the trustees of the Halcro scheme, which went through a restructuring, which they will talk about. And Faith was, uh, Sackers were the, uh, the trustees' legal advisors. A lot of you will also be aware that Chris's uh, other claim to fame and uh, TV stardom uh, is his role as chairman of the trustees of the BHS pension scheme, uh, as that is much more public domain than it was when the programme for this conference was put together. Uh, when we get to questions, Chris is happy to take and in possi possibly in some cases even answer uh, questions on the BHS pension scheme. So I think without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Chris and Faith. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as um, Peter says, um, in this session, Chris and I are going to sort of focus in on one of the aspects that is being looked at in more detail by the Green Paper and the DB Task Force, really focusing in on scheme restructurings for um, schemes in a distressed and stressed sort of environment. Um, and as Peter says, we're going to focus on Halcro as a, as a case study. Um, laying my cards on the table, I guess. I couldn't with confidence say we've got a system that works at the moment if it takes knights on yachts. There were knights on knights in shining armor on horses in my day, but knights on yachts and regulatory dragons and two select committee reports to reach an outcome for a pension scheme. That doesn't seem to me to be efficient. Um, I think Halt Crow shows that you can be more efficient within the system, although it's difficult and it doesn't really work perfectly. So anyway, we're going to have a look at what you can and can't learn from Halt Crow and what it might um, uh, be useful for in terms of pointers of how you might build in more flexibility for the future. So um, we're going to talk a bit about how it fits with the pensions landscape more broadly and the current legal background, what we actually did on how query restructuring, um, how it sort of feeds into the green paper discussion uh, and just float some straw man ideas generally as to how the system might change to allow us more flexibility to achieve better outcomes for members. Um, and uh, very useful, I think, this session sort of following on from the last discussion, um, talking very much in the same kind of language landscape um, and obviously the DB task force is putting forward the idea of consolidation and super funds as one way of dealing with this. Um, I think we're probably going to discuss some others. Thank you Faith um, and thank you Peter for the introduction. Just one small correction, not, not in relation to BHS but I, I'm not the chair of Halcro, the chair is actually in the audience so I've been very careful what I say <laughs> from now on. So, uh, so I'm just going to spend a, a couple of minutes setting the exam question, which hopefully we'll come back to uh, answer uh, later in this afternoon's discussion. Was the Halcro pensions restructuring just an interesting case study, or does it really create a blueprint uh, for the future of dealing with some of the challenges in the DB sector? And just defining those challenges, I've heard a lot of discussion today about um, how many schemes are on this spectrum from being stressed all the way through to distressed and possible entry to the PPF. And the numbers seem to range from 500 to 2,000, depending on how you measure them. And I wonder whether we're spending too much time trying to count them um, than, than really focus on what the underlying issue is here. I suspect that a significant proportion of those schemes that are on the stress to distress spectrum are there because they've got failing uh, employers, employers that are failing for business-related reasons, nothing to do with the pension scheme. So there have been 700 um, enter the P sorry, 800 enter the PPF over the last 10 years because the companies had reached the end of their natural life. So I think, don't think we should, um, uh, should focus on, on that entire universe and try to solve the entire uh, issue at once. I suggest that we ought to be focusing on those situations where it's the DB pension scheme that is making an otherwise viable business unable to survive and hence unable to deliver a better level of benefits than, uh, than would be the case in PPF. So we focus our attention in on the, on the situations whether it's the DB scheme that's the elephant in the room. If we tackle that, I think we can deliver better outcomes for members of those schemes in a very focused way. Unfortunately, and Faith will expand on this in a moment, the law really doesn't help us. Um, 
It doesn't help the way in which trustees behave. It doesn't uh, help with the behaviour of employers. Uh, and it also um, throws up barriers to us in terms of how we assess um, uh, value and when trustees should act to try to maximise that value. So it's a very, um, very simplistic example, and it's very obvious, um, that the more stressed um, a situation becomes, the less value is available in the sponsoring employer to support the schemes. So a smart and brave set of trustees would try and exit that situation and maximise the value at an early stage. But the law, as currently framed, drives us to wait until insolvency is inevitable before we do something about it. And when insolvency is inevitable, we've just destroyed the value that we're trying to protect from members. There's a clear barrier here to delivering better member outcomes. So regulated apportionment arrangements uh, are the, uh, the method of choice at the moment of trying to address that issue. But as I say, the RAA will require um, the uh, sponsoring employer to be inevitably insolvent within 12 months. There is no value left to attribute to members once you get to that point. Alternatively, um, CVAs can be used in restructuring uh, members' benefits and the sponsoring employer. But again, it puts the sponsoring employer through a very stressful uh, insolvency process which destroys value, and it's the value that you then want to, uh, to harness to support the members' benefits. Well, the alternative version, which is the one in the middle, uh, which any trustee in the room will come out in, in a cold sweat just thinking about, is a non-statutory compromise. So we as trustees recognise when value is diminishing, and we say, right, we're going to act now, but to do that, we have to give up our Section 75 rights and take a once and for all settlement in the interest of our members. Getting that wrong is something you're going to be answering for for a number of years. Uh, I gave myself the opportunity to talk about the law, but I don't think I will because it's not that interesting. <laughs> we move on. Um, okay, so moving on to think more about what flexibility we might look for in the, in the future. Um, we're very used in the DB environment to trying to uh, balance up uh, the assumptions that we're using for funding, um, the investment strategy, looking and balancing with the strength of the employer covenant and trying to reach a kind of balanced outcome that will allow you to proceed with a sustainable scheme which will provide members with benefits at the end of the day. But I think a lot of us in the room will be getting used to seeing situations where playing with those factors isn't actually giving enough flexibility. Uh, so where else can we look? Um, and I suppose uh, I'm struggling to come up with um, any other ideas than what we're left with is benefits. Can we make benefits more flexible? And there's been a lot of discussion already today about you know, uh, trying to get to, being able to get to a position where um, instead of uh, PPF or 100%, we might provide somewhere in the middle. And that's really what we're, what we're trying to get at. Um, the Green Paper and, and MPs, I think, are very queasy about the idea of being able to reduce benefits. Um, the Green Paper talks a lot about what it describes as hard promises uh, that have been given to members, and I think um, you know, it's interesting to debate uh, how hard we thought those promises were at the beginning, how they've been communicated to people. Um, from a human rights perspective, which is ultimately what the government would need to look at if it was going to give more flexibility in the legislation, you're really looking at property promises uh, and, and whether, you can, whether the government can take property away from people. Um, but I keep coming back to the sort of fundamental question, you know, when does reality enter into this? You know, what does reality matter? Um, are you really reducing somebody's contractual promise or property promise if what you're giving them is more than they would get in the PPF? If you've reached a position where you think uh, it's inevitable that uh, the scheme is going to go into the PPF, then if you could provide PPF plus, surely that's an increase rather than a reduction in their benefits. Um, so, I mean, and in terms of what the hurdles the government needs to get over, um, human rights legislation would stop uh, the state or the government um, legislating to deprive people of property. But again, I would argue that we wouldn't be depriving people of property, we may be reducing it, but there's a long way, uh, in my mind, legally between reducing uh, and, and depriving. Um, it worries me slightly that the Green Paper is setting out all the arguments why the government thinks it can't uh, introduce this new flexibility and, and um, I'd, I'd like as an, in, as an industry um, to uh, try and help them get over that. There you go. Thank you, Faith. 
So uh, briefly, a canter through the Halcro uh, case study and where we started from, what we delivered, and then we'll come back, uh, hopefully, some of the learning points from it and, and think about whether they're applicable in other situations. So uh, Halcro was a long-established um, worldwide, sorry, still is a, <laughs> a long-established worldwide uh, consulting uh, practice, engineering consulting practice. Uh, it had the business, was financially stressed by 2011, but actually, underlying that stress, there was a viable business that could support some form of uh, DV benefits for the members going forwards. It was acquired in 2011 by CH2M Hill, uh, a US uh, company, um, and uh, oddly, uh, in strange circumstances, the, the members of the pension scheme decided, or a number of them, vocal number of them, decided they would object to the acquisition because they thought the acquisition would weaken how Crow's uh, covenant long term. And that objection never really went away in the five years we spent on the restructuring. CH2M Hill knew that they were buying a business with a material pension deficit. So they didn't blunder into this, they did this consciously. So they knew that the deficit was there. What they didn't realize was that the business had some other um, liabilities, which when put together meant that the uh, deficit uh, and our view on covenants uh, was going to create a burden for the UK business that could, couldn't be supported long term. And the US were very clear at an early stage that they would not ride into this and, uh, and simply offer a guarantee uh, to support the pension scheme funding. I think on six separate occasions I heard the US uh, CFO say, we will not guarantee this pension scheme. It he was said it with a US clear. accent, though, rather than the hey, Sorry, I, I can't, yeah, I can only do it with an Essex accent, but yes, absolutely. But very, very clear and very important point, and they distanced themselves from, the, um, uh, from supporting the scheme. So something changed. Something changed when the deficit got so big that it was actually threatening uh, the solvency of the UK business. The CFO also changed. He left his job um, quite quickly, in fact, overnight, I think. <laughs> I'm sure he was aware he was going. Um, falling gilt yields were driving the deficit up. Um, and the parent company had to make a choice. So the US parent had to decide whether to continue supporting um, its UK subsidiary, which it had done for five years. It had continued to put sufficient money into the business to allow it to pay all of deficit repair contributions, to allow it to carry on trading. But they reached a point where they said to us, uh, unless you achieve some benefit relief, which is a, uh, <laughs> it's a, a, a un unusual term, yeah. but um, again, uh, works better with a US accent, uh, we will withdraw our support from our subsidiary. So they put it in very stark terms that uh, unless you sort out and reduce members' benefits, then we will walk away from this. Some huge challenges for trustees. We've talked in the earlier session about how challenging this whole process can be for trustees. Because of the market sensitivity of making the statement that we will walk away and we won't support this company anymore, uh, the US wanted us as trustees to conduct the entire process on a confidential basis without members' knowledge. That drove us to uh, needing to consider whether we could transfer members from the current scheme to a new DB scheme with lower benefits, but do it without their consent. It's, uh, it led us to challenging uh, in court whether Regulation 12 for bulk transfers could be applied in those circumstances to take members from a situation where we said it will inevitably fall into the PPF to a scheme that provided higher than PPF benefits, but do it without telling the members that we were doing it. Regulation 12 was debated for two days in court. Uh, two days of my life I will never get back. The Americans enjoyed it particularly. It was, uh, it was a, a, yes, an incredible experience. Uh, and uh, despite the, um, the judge uh, finding that um, the trustees had been through a proper process, she also found that um, Regulation 12 wasn't going to be applicable uh, to the solution we were trying to deliver. So that meant that the structure we wanted to put in place, a bulk transfer without consent to members, uh, to a scheme that provides 100% of starting pension but with lower statutory revaluations and lower pension increases, couldn't work. So regulation 12 and, and transfer without consent stopped us putting in a, members in a place where they were going to get benefits higher than PPF and underpinned by PPF with a £120 million US parent company guarantee, the, the same uh, US parent that said we'll never guarantee this deficit 
So it moves all the way around, but because we can't do this without members' consent, we couldn't put this in place. Regulation 12 is odd, where it was there originally uh, designed to protect members' interests, but in this case, it stopped yeah. us protecting yeah. members' interests. Yeah. And, it, and it's something that will um, need fundamentally to be tackled if, if super funds are to get off the ground, because uh, you, you, the court is very clearly saying you compare sort of headline benefits in one scheme and another, rather yeah, than absolutely. look at the reality of the situation. And I think um, Reg 12 needs to be updated to reflect reality. Of you so you'd be comparing what somebody is going to re um, receive in reality compared with what they'll receive in the new scheme, rather than what you're pretending they might receive. Absolutely. So that one didn't work. Uh, so we had a lot of head scratching, uh, a lot of soul searching, a lot of late night cups of coffee. Uh, and eventually, um, there was a recognition that uh, when, the, well, when the judgment was, uh, was issued, all of the uh, confidential information would come into the public domain anyway. Uh, and we managed to convince our uh, US uh, ultimate sponsor that we could do this with member consent. So uh, the trustees ran a process of offering members the opportunity to transfer to a new DB scheme with uh, the same headline level of um, starting pension, but with lower evaluations and lower increases. Interestingly, this time with um, uh, £80 million mitigation being paid into the scheme to improve the funding level, um, a smaller parent company guarantee of £50 million. And really importantly, uh, the trustees also took 20% of the equity in the restructured Halcro group. We didn't just take that for anti-embarrassment reasons. We took that because at some point we think it will have some value and we think it will again uh, go to improve member outcomes at a later stage. So the, the equity, I think, is, a, is an important point in all restructuring. So the ultimate um, delivery uh, is a long-term and we think sustainable DB scheme. It provides better benefits for members, higher level benefits than uh, they would have got in the PPF. 93% of members transferred on a with consent basis. Uh, and Halcro continues to trade and support the scheme. Very interesting all the way through our process of making offers to members and, and telling them about the new scheme and, and what the uh, adjusted benefits would be, the vocal action group that I mentioned at the beginning continued to be very vocal and continued to communicate with the members and to try to discourage them su from supporting the solution. At the end of the day, all but one of the action group also decided to transfer to the new scheme. We came up with a solution that I think all members could see was viable and sustainable and was a better outcome mm. than would otherwise occur. Sorry, to come back to Regulation 12 though, so 7% so of the um, liabilities didn't transfer. We strongly suspect that those are the 7% who most needed the trustees to act on their behalf. They're the people who didn't understand what was being offered, uh, weren't capable of making decisions or simply weren't traceable. But because of the way of Reg, Reg 12 works and we can't transfer without consent, the ones that were most vulnerable got left behind. And that just doesn't seem like a, uh, the right sort of protection for uh, members in that situation. So is Halcro an interesting case study or does it create a blueprint for the future? There are a couple of really distinct features in Halcro which I suspect won't occur in many restructuring situations. First of all, the, um, the length and depth to which the US parent company went to support the business. So it supported it for more than five years uh, as a loss-making business, allowed it to pay all of its deficit repair contributions. That was a huge commitment. Why did they make that huge commitment? Culturally, both for Halcro and for CH, it was incredibly important that they, they weren't seen to walk away from a situation and, a, and an insolvent outcome for them would have been incredibly value destructive uh, worldwide. So there's a couple of features there that make Halcro exceptional. But I think there are at least six features that also um, uh, I see occur in other pension restructuring, uh, in, and, and some of these occur in the uh, BHS situation as well. Uh, I think if we can start looking at situations where there may be value to add for members by filtering out the opportunities to apply these sorts of uh, solvent restructuring templates. These are some of the, uh, the characteristics we'll see. So size does matter. You have to get to a point where it's obvious to all the stakeholders that the deficit in the DB scheme is what's uh, destroying value in the sponsor and likely to make it uh, unviable going forward. So size really is important. But perhaps the most critical one is, is that that business 
that's going to support the scheme going forwards has to have underlying value. If it's simply, if it's a business that's going to fail anyway, there's no point in starting the restructuring process. It becomes one of those uh, 700 that rightly moves to the protection of the PPF. 800. 800, sorry. 800. Um, very helpful to have a stable debt structure. Clearly, uh, having external secured debt makes any form of restructuring very difficult and uh, very helpful if the uh, trustees have a seat at the table because their debt is ranking alongside the banks. The balance of powers are incredibly important. Uh, trustees obviously uh, sometimes shy away from these, um, but if we have a wind-up power or we have a contribution power, or simply we just understand the culture of the business in a way that allows us to uh, use that uh, for our benefit in terms of, uh, of driving member outcomes, the balance of power between sponsor and trustee is sometimes, um, is sometimes overlooked and taken for granted. Two obvious ones, you need open-minded management and open-minded trustees. Uh, it's getting to that point again where everyone realises there's got to be some, some pain for all stakeholders and that the management can accept that in the same way as the trustees can accept it on behalf of the members. And any solution is going to affect equity, creditors and members together. Again, like any rounded solution, everybody needs to suffer some pain to get the right outcome. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so broadening out from some of those sort of common features that Chris has explained uh, can lead to successful, uh, successful set of circumstances for restructuring to how that might feed into the debate uh, that's been now um, developed by the Green Paper. Um, it's very clear from the Green Paper that uh, MPs, government, are worried um, that any new flexibility will lead you know, to more moral hazard issues. And, you know, you can't help but sympathise with them. Yes, if you give the opportunity for um, things to be reduced, then people will look and see whether they can reduce them, benefits to be reduced. Um, but you, you will never get a perfect answer to the question of whether the employer is throwing up a smoke screen or whether there truly is a burning platform. Um, but... Uh, there are enough burning platforms out there that we need to be able to identify them uh, and, and deal with them. Um, and I wouldn't want a concern about moral hazard to skew uh, what could and should otherwise, I think, be quite a radical debate about uh, how we could, you know, how we can change the agenda, introduce more flexibility. Um, DB Task Force is obviously being very radical with its suggestions about super funds, uh, and there are other, um, you know, and other possible solutions as well, I think, that, that could, you know, could make an equally radical shift. Um, also, I think the, the, there's a real problem with over-concern with moral hazard that um, we, we end up kicking the can again. I'm, I'm a, a strong, strong opponent of, of can kicking. Uh, I personally think it's gaming the PPF. Um, there, but there, there is a, a little bit of a feeling to me of complacency in the green paper that the the, the, it, it, things are, are working just about now, and the MPs would rather it's a future generation of MPs that have to deal with this. Uh, and in the meantime, some, you know, quite a lot more people will get quite a lot of benefits, and that's good for them, isn't it? Um, except it's not good for the people who haven't got their pensions and um, are going to get their benefits cut back in future. So, um, I, um, yeah, I, I think we need to tackle can kicking. Um, other kind of concerns, I guess, around the green paper and things that um, I'd like to, you know, to, to enter into the debate about, um, that there's a huge difference between the support you'd like uh, the group as a whole to give your pension scheme uh, and actually the legal obligations to support the pension scheme. You know, there are, li like the Harcrow situation, there are lots of situations where there's a specific employer that has legal liability for the scheme uh, and the wider group has no legal responsibility for it whatsoever. Um, we can have all the good words we like about how we'd like the wider group to support the scheme, but you know, the legal obligation is not there and we just need to face up to it. Um, I don't think we'll be thanked if moral hazard concerns stop better member outcomes. Uh, if, you know, uh, going back to the point that's been made in previous sessions and Chris has been making, um, if in fact what you're offering, if you're being honest with members and saying, we can't provide you 100p in the pound, we can provide you with 80p in the pound. If you went to the PPF, you'd get 70p in the pound. It, the choice is actually fairly clear to members and, and, uh, and members won't like it, but uh, it, it, it is a better outcome potentially than, than, than otherwise where they'll end up. 
So, um, and I think, you know, again, building on what Chris is saying about, we're not saying that, um, you know, that, that all the thousands of potentially stressed businesses out there can be uh, assisted by more flexibility, but there's a good number that could. We're not looking for a general power to reduce benefits in all circumstances, um, but yes, more flexibility where schemes are genuinely stressed. Um, and then there's a, a lot of concern in the Green Paper about how do we define, you know, what's a distressed scheme? How do we define a distressed employer? Well, you're never going to do it because there's not going to be one size fits all answer. Um, but if we build some flexibility into the system, then we can allow trustees and employers and the regulators and other stakeholders to reach a sensible outcome without having to define everything uh, from, from the beginning. Um, I'm going to flip very quickly through a, a few of the current issues with the legislation, um, but not dwell on it too much, um, and then just um, talk through a sort of a little bit of a straw man for um, a way we might change legislation to get where I think it would be helpful to get to. Um, Chris has already spoken about timing issues. Uh, it is recognised in the Green Paper that at the moment, the way legislation works because of the RAA structure, essentially you're looking at insolvency within 12 months before you can even get into a dialogue, uh, and that's not long enough. And I think that is recognised, and I think yep. you know, hopefully there will be um, a shift away from the 12 months to give people longer to, to discuss restructuring uh, and explore possibilities. Chris talked about the importance of, of, of mitigation in how um, we have a cash payment into the scheme, but also very significantly the equity holding in the sponsor. Um, obviously, pension legislation doesn't um, help you very much with that because um, for reasons of Maxwell uh, jumping off boats, um, we have very uh, restrictive provisions around what, um, uh, what investment you can hold in your sponsor. Um, so probably we need a little bit of flexibility there where actually you're taking a, a holding in the equity of the sponsor for mitigation purposes. Um, but again, it, um, it, it can be done. And it, it, it's, I, I think it, taking equity is a simple way of uh, giving, delivering potential upside in the future rather than trying to create Sorry. some complex legal structure that no doubt the employer will be able to subvert at some point in the future. Um, Chris has already talked uh, a lot about the problems of getting member consent. Um, the, the task force was talking earlier this morning about probably wanting to consult with members before they were transferred to a super fund. Um, Leslie made a very sensible uh, point that actually members don't understand these things that well. They're very complicated. Um, and you know, I, I think there is um, something around us getting bolder about saying trustees are there to look after members' interests as a whole. Trustees should be able to understand the issues. They should be able to make the decision in the interests of members as a whole. Um, and actually asking for individual consent and requiring individual consent um, is not as helpful as it sounds. So... Um, what might a different straw man look like? I say different, different to the super fund idea. So, um, and I, I don't know, this, this possibly builds a little bit on you know, Kevin's points in the last session. Um, there's going to be a lot of parliamentary time taken up with Brexit in the next couple of years, uh, and we may be, it may be in our interest to try and find relatively self-contained ways of changing the system, changing the legislation to try and uh, build in some more flexibility. Um, it strikes me that you could amend uh, Section 67 of the Pensions Act, which is obviously there to protect members' interests at the moment, members' accrued benefits at the moment. Um, you could amend it to allow a kind of trigger for allowing benefit reduction. So your trigger might be that if the trustees consider insolvency is likely on the balance of possibilities or probabilities within, say, two to three years, then they've if they pass that, um, that bar, um, then trustees may be uh, allowed to put together a proposal for um, reducing members' benefits. You might restrict what uh, benefit changes um, could be made, and probably realistically, most restructurings are going to be built around being able to change increases. Mm -hmm. When you start to look at doing other things, you end up... Uh, quite quickly putting people below PPF uh, level of compensation, and, and I can't, can't see why you would want to do that. Um, so you can probably prescribe the changes that could be made. Um, you could require trustees to make sure they secure some mitigation before they can put a proposal together or, or present a proposal. Um, we'd obviously need a debate about whether we need PPF and or uh, TPR uh, agreement um, to the mitigation, to the uh, proposal as a whole, and I suspect um, 
industry and government would want to see some regulatory involvement. You could require the appointment of an independent professional trustee, uh, somebody who hopefully has the experience and is you know, bold enough and open-minded enough to, uh, to, 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 to um, go ahead with a, a, a restructuring. I mean, I just think it's too much to put on lay trustees. Um, uh, if, if, the, if it's only lay trustees around the board table, I, I think it's, um, yeah, it, it, it is too complex an issue for us to expect them as an industry to, to tackle on their own. Um, and um, I think it would be important to require the information to share employer, uh, to apply the employer to share information with the, the trustees because you can't, I mean, you can't put together a proposal unless you're convinced it is truly a burning platform. And if you're going to convince the regulator, you're going to have to be able to demonstrate it's a burning platform. But at the moment, there's a real kind of imbalance of, uh, of power, really, for um, trustees and employers in terms of who knows yeah. what. Um, I'm not going to focus on that. And that's essentially, there's another sort of straw man proposal if you wanted to enable members to have an opt-out, but it's broadly the same kind of principles. Um, conscious of time, but just very quickly, um, we started having a, an initial think about uh, some questions you might want to ask yourselves um, about the, uh, how aggregators would work for distress schemes, so how a sort of super fund would work for distress schemes. Mm. Some of the obvious com uh, questions um, around benefit harmonization, uh, well, presumably you'd have to reduce the benefits in the original scheme before you transferred them in order to have, be able to do your actuarial equivalence transfer that the task force have been talking about. Um, presumably your super fund would provide some kind of PPF underpin, otherwise why would the trustees want to transfer to it? Um, I think one really big issue is how the sort of entry fee will be paid for distressed employers. Distressed employers don't have that much money. That's what makes them distressed. Exactly, uh, yes. Um, and, and they don't generally have banks wanting to lend to them. And so I, I think it is a, a, a if, real If they have issue free practice. assets that they can um, yeah. provide security for to, to pay entry fees, then the banks would have been there first. Exactly. I think there clearly are different moral hazard issues um, with, uh, with, with, with aggregators um, and you, you give up ongoing support from the group. Uh, I think from trustees' perspective, sort of handing everything over to an unsegregated fund, which might look fine when you go in, but if it gets the maths wrong in a few years' time and um, has to wind up, it tips everybody into PPF, mm -hmm. whereas if it had been a segregated master trust, then you might have saved your segregated section. Quite a hard decision for, 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 uh, for trustees. Uh, and I think there might be confidentiality issues around employers and trustees wanting to share enough, enough information with the, with the aggregator for, uh, for, for, for the deal to be done. Um, so I think, I think you know, aggregators are, are certainly an interesting, um, you know, an interesting additional um, option uh, mm. to, to be considered, but there are definitely some, um, uh, some tricky questions to be asked along the way. So, do you want to wrap up? Uh, it was very briefly conscious of time, I yeah. guess, uh, if there was one sort of overriding uh, theme coming out, a, a message, it would be that as an industry we probably need to focus on that smaller subset of schemes and, uh, and uh, distress where we can actually do something to deliver better outcomes for members and accept that some of the others just aren't viable long term. Yeah. There's quite, a good, there's quite a good aggregator at the moment for the very distressed schemes. Exactly. That, it's called the PPF. Yeah. Yeah, it's the right aggregator yeah. in those circumstances. Uh, and actually just put the member outcomes at the centre of this mm. and put the process as something that has to be worked uh, through and around, but don't let it get in the way of delivering those better outcomes to members. Yep. Okay, okay thank you very much. We do have a few minutes left for uh, questions, so we can take some questions from the floor. So if we can have the house lights up, and when you ask the question, please can you uh, announce who you are and the name of the organisation that you represent? And there's a lady in the middle there, a lady with dark hair with her hand up sitting next to Trevor. Um, so if we can take the question from the lady, I can't see who it is, and then after that, could you pass the microphone to Trevor and we'll take his, we'll take both questions and then do the answers. Okay. Okay, I'm Kate Yates from Plumbing Pensions. Um, it sounds like you had some very complex issues. How did you manage the conflicts that you probably had among your trustee board, if you had employer reps and, and lay people? And how did you manage the communications with members? Because 93% on such a complex issue is actually quite an achievement. Uh, Can we take, take Trevor's yeah. Uh, question? Um, yeah, I'm just interested. It seems that we focused on a number of things where there are reasonably big employers where you can get a lot of publicity with the BHS yeah. um, and there are certain circumstances where you've been able to get solutions because of political pressure 
but it still seems to me that we just aren't given enough power to the pensions regulator to come up with things. I mean, there are things that have gone on for a lot longer, like Box Clever, mm. which is not that dissimilar to a situation at PHS, mm -hmm. and yet it's dragged on for years and years, and it's nowhere near a solution with you know, an employer that's got lots of money but isn't willing to pay in. Um, and I just wondered to what extent we should really aim and, 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 uh, and put our pressure behind, given the regulator more uh, power from the politicians and able to actually crack heads together in a better way. Okay, thank you. I think it's, that's an interesting point there that Trevor makes about the dis distinction yep. between an employer that can't support a scheme mm -hmm. and an employer that doesn't actually want to support a scheme, which is a bit different. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, can I do the first two yeah, questions? Of course. <laughs> first, of course. So I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the, uh, Trevor's question. So, in, in um, so uh, I think the one of the questions was around communications and how do we deliver a message in a, in a, an effective way. Uh, in its simplest term, that we did it um, by putting a lot of legwork and a lot of effort into issuing, I think we issued three or four written communications. We then roadshowed, we gave every, gave every member the opportunity to, uh, to ask questions face to face. We had an IFA helpline. Again, it goes to that, the, the theme on Halcro, which is why I don't think it is necessarily the blueprint for, for this sort of restructuring is that the, the uh, US sponsor stood behind the entire cost of that communications exercise as well. Yep. And I think that's, a, again, it's a, it's a demonstration of the, the, the depth of the support. Um, I think in other situations, we wouldn't get the same take-up rate because we simply wouldn't be able to commit that level of support to, um, uh, mm -hmm. to, to running the process. Should I pick up the conflicts point as well? Yes, please. Um, yeah. and in, in terms of conflicts, um, to be honest, it, it's, uh, although there are um, employer-nominated people on the board and um, trustee-nominated uh, directors, obviously, um, it is a board of great integrity. They are, none, none, of, none of them ever uh, really represent themselves as being uh, on, on one side or, or another. Um, we uh, made sure everybody declared their interests and conflicts at the start. All the um, board members, in fact, were... Um, uh, were members of the scheme as well, apart from Chris, obviously. Um, so they had personal interest too. So, it, but it was uh, just you know, dealt with openly uh, up front. And uh, if ever anybody felt uncomfortable about a position, we'd just discuss it. I mean, it, it's, just, it's as simple as that. So there was, there was one point where um, we were oh, yes. discussing uplifts yeah. to members' benefits. Yeah. There was a small uplift to members' yeah. benefits as well. So that, and the board was happy to delegate to the professional trustee to make that decision, taking advice. Mm -hmm. So absolutely aware of conflicts all the yeah. way through and made the right delegations. And what about Trevor's? Mm -hmm. So Trevor's question was about: Does the regulator need more powers to bang heads together? Was that the? Yeah, and I guess that uh, that also goes to the resourcing point mm. as well, and where the regulator can get most bang for its buck in mm. terms of applying its pressure. Because generally, those larger companies are going to be sponsoring larger, larger schemes with more members. Uh, in terms of whether, so personally, I think the regulator has enough tools in the toolbox to, um, to make it work um, and to bang heads together. Uh, the profile definitely helps if you're trying to find a solution, but it, it does cut both ways, actually, having been involved in a, a number of restructurings. Uh, a high-profile case brings a natural nervousness as well, so it isn't just, it doesn't necessarily beneficial if you're a big company with a big name. It actually makes some of the decision making harder because some of the uh, you tend to be tested slightly, uh, slightly further by the regulator. And I suppose I suppose some of the arguments we're making about building more flexibility in would probably allow would empower trustees a bit more to do things. And, and actually, an interesting point that the select committee made was that in certain circumstances, if trustees have gone through a certain procedure, uh, the regulator should almost kind of start from the point that it presumes it will do what the you know, it, will, it will follow the, the trustees' yeah. uh, decision, um, subject obviously to checking that it had gone through the right procedure and being satisfied itself, I suppose, that there weren't other regulatory powers it could use. But I think that sort of um, building in the possibility of a kind of presumption that the trustees have made the right decision would actually be useful. Yeah, rather than at the moment you sort of start from, uh, well, okay, I'll consider it again and see yeah. if the trustees got it right or yeah. not. So yeah. that, that adds a lot of delay into the process. Okay, we are nearly out of time. Yeah. There seems to be a question over there. It looks like Clive Gilchrist from Best Trustees to me. <laughs> yes. um, just really following up on, on that point, but 
the checklist of, of, of things that you listed earlier, I mean, what you achieved there was a fantastic one-off solution, but it was a one-off solution. Okay. To, to generalise it, I think, requires at least some and perhaps all of the things on your checklist. Where are you going to get the political motivation to enact that? Because it all seems terribly sensible. And the RAAs, I mean, I did, as Clive knows mm. very well, I did an RAA in 2013. They're incredibly mm. complicated. Oh, they are. They're all one-off solutions. That, complicated you know, and, and expensive. Complicated and yeah. seriously expensive. Yeah. I mean, yeah. hundreds of thousands of pounds in fees. Mm. Which, is, which is why I think we come back to this. As an industry, we need to be looking at those cases where we can act and make a difference mm. and targeting mm. those mm. cases mm. And, and just accepting, to Faith's point, that the PPF is perhaps the appropriate aggregator in yeah. other situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything you want to add on that? No, it's fine. Yeah. No. Okay. Well, the time clock has gone on to zero, Perfect. which means that in a couple of minutes the trap door will open and we will all <laughs> fall through into the basement. So uh, thank you all very much for your attendance. And please, can we thank uh, Faith and Chris in the usual way?